as some of you might know, I live here in Nashville and have for quite a while, but before that, I grew up all the way over here in Bristol, Tennessee. Whenever I tell people I'm from Bristol, Tennessee, they either have no idea what it is or know it for one of two reasons. The first being the best NASCAR track in the entire world, the Bristol Motor Speedway, or they know us as the birthplace of country music. But why do people say that Bristol is the birthplace of country music? That seems objectively false. Country music definitely wasn't first played in Bristol. It even wasn't first recorded recorded there, so what about it makes it the birthplace of country music? Recently, when I was back in Bristol for a little bit, I decided to stop by the birthplace of country music museum and figure out why this small town is such a hollowed place for country music. If you end up liking this video, consider giving it a like, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss more stories like this from music history. As someone who really cares about history, it's easy for me to get wrapped up in first. Where did this first happen? Who was the first person to do this? As if that's the ultimate decider of importance. Maybe that's fair, it probably isn't but let's look at a couple first. Where was country music first played? As with any major genre, that's almost impossible to say. The answer kind of depends on a couple of questions, namely, what do you consider country music and who's telling the story? Country music has its roots in the folk songs that settlers would bring over from the old world when they settled in the kind of rural communities in the Appalachian Mountains. And look, I know I'm bad at pronouncing things. I mispronounce things all the time on this channel. It's how, Appalachian is how you say it. I will not be told differently. It's Appalachian. This type of music was largely focused around the fiddle and featured more storytelling type songs, but as different musical cultures and musical traditions started intermingling and mixing in these southern communities, it created something entirely new. Sometimes this type of music is called hillbilly music, old time music, traditional music, Appalachian music, a variety of different names. It blends folk songs with elements of blues songs and gospel songs. With all of this overlap in different language, it's basically impossible to say where country music was first played, no matter what you call it. If someone says they can pinpoint exactly where it was first played and who first played it, then they're they're probably wrong or someone else would have a different opinion. So in our effort to track down first, even though this music was played long before recorded music was even a thing, we kind of have to turn our attention to who was the first person to record it. And for that, we do have more of an answer. Alexander Eck Robertson grew up on a farm in the Texas Panhandle. He came from a long line of fiddlers. His father and grandfather participated in fiddling competitions, so naturally he learned to play the fiddle too. In 1922, Eck and his music partner Henry C. Gilliland traveled to New York and auditioned for the Victor Talking Machine Company. They got a contract and recorded four songs. The next day, Eck came back without Henry and recorded more songs. Those recorded Recordings are largely seen as the first commercial recordings of country music, but Victor didn't really do anything with them until OK Records released songs recorded by Fiddle and John Carson, and those kind of created some interest in this new hillbilly music. That's when Victor figured, we should probably do something with these records we have, because we were here first, but OK just capitalized on it better. So if Eck and Henry were the first people to record country music, and that happened in New York City, and Fiddle and John Carson was the first one to bring it to public attention, and he was from Georgia and recorded in Atlanta, why did Congress say in 1998 that Bristol is the birthplace of country music? Well, that's because of the Bristol Sessions. The Bristol Sessions began with Ralph Peer. He was from Missouri, where his father owned a store that sold both gramophones and records, which was relatively new technology at the time. In 1919, before country music as a genre existed, Ralph moved to New York to work for OK Records. Ralph took a trip down south to look for artists who could compete with Bessie Smith, who was a breakout star for Victor. So when he got down south, people started suggesting that he record this guy named Fiddle and John Carson. So Ralph brought a mobile recording unit to Georgia, recorded Fiddle and John Carson, and even though he thought the records were terrible, they were kind of a surprise smash hit. For the next two years, Ralph tried to capitalize on that success of Fiddle and John Carson and made several trips to the South to record what he was calling hillbilly music. Then, in 1925, he quit OK Records and went to work for Victor, who was really looking to expand into that hillbilly music genre. Ralph said, quote, I had what they wanted. They couldn't get into the hillbilly business, and I knew how to do it, end quote. Ralph was something of a visionary when it came to music 
business, whenever he joined Victor, his salary was $1 a year. He said, quote, I would be willing to go to work for nothing with the understanding that there would be no objection if I controlled these copyrights, end quote. So whatever artist he found, he would control the copyrights of what he recorded with them, which meant he needed new music. He couldn't record songs for these artists that already had copyrights. For that, he knew he needed to make another trip down south and record artists in the field, as they called it. So in 1927, he got Victor to agree to send him down south with some of the best technology available at that time, including an actual microphone, in order to find and record some of these artists in their actual communities. And a lot of these artists couldn't or wouldn't make the trip up to New York to record for Victor there. But Ralph really didn't know where to go, so he turned to Ernest Stoneman, who was a country music musician that Ralph had recorded for OK back in 1924. Ernest recommended he set up in Bristol for several reasons. At the time, it was the most popular city in the Appalachian region with a really bustling train station that was just like right outside of downtown. It was close by several states, including North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, South Carolina, West Virginia, all within really reasonable traveling distance to Bristol. And it was known as having a pretty vibrant musical community. So Ralph took the best technology of the day and traveled down to Bristol to record some of the local artists. He set up in the abandoned Taylor Christian Hat Company factory building on State Street. It's called State Street because it's the literal border of Tennessee and Virginia. One side of the street is Tennessee, the other side of the street is Virginia. It's still kind of the downtown area of Bristol and it has a few cool little things there, including a really great record store called Cheap Thrills. I was actually able to find the Ramones demo record, which was like a record store day exclusive this past year that I missed out on, so I was able to get it there, and that's really cool. Check out Cheap Thrills if you're ever in the Bristol area. Between July 25th and August 5th, 1927, Ralph set up in that warehouse and held auditions for Victor. He offered artists $50 per song he cut with them, with the provision that he would own the copyright and they would get a modest royalty on any record records sold. He put an ad in the Bristol News Bulletin telling people about the recording sessions and also highlighting that Ernest Stoneman had made $3,600 in royalties off of his recordings. That got people's attention and they started flocking to Bristol to record. Ralph utilized top-notch technology to do something that really hadn't been done before. Ashira Morris, writing for PBS, pointed out that Ralph, quote, was one of the first to record artists on site instead of taking them out of their environments and into an unfamiliar studio. End quote. By doing that, I think he was able to create a more authentic sound as well as recording artists who would never have made the trip up to New York either because they couldn't or because they had no interest in it and it allowed their songs and their voices and their styles to get out there in a way that never would have been possible if he didn't do that. Ralph also pioneered music business contracts because the type of contracts that he was offering at that time was unique, but it became standard for the business going forward. A one-time fee for the recording paid from the label to the artist with a modest royalty on any record sold moving forward, and then what is essentially a publishing contract with him controlling the copyright on all of the songs. He also signed any artists that he recorded to management deals with him, but some of those worked out, some of them didn't. These sessions are why Bristol is known as the birthplace of country music, because while it was far from the first instance of country music being recorded, it wasn't even the first instance of popular country songs being recorded, it is what became known as the Big Bang of country music. These sessions launched country music into wider public attention and gave the genre some of its first superstars. There were some who weren't destined to be superstars, but were still relatively popular at the time. Of course, his old friend Ernest Stoneman recorded some tracks in Bristol. Blind Alfred Reed recorded the soon-to-be classic How Can a poor man stand such times and live. Alfred G. Carnes recorded several gospel songs. Arguably, the most important find came during the second week of the sessions. A.P. Carter, his wife Sarah, and his wife's sister Maybell made the trip from nearby Mesa Spring, Virginia. Victor released some of their songs in November of 1927, but then they re-released another single from the sessions in December of 1928 that became really popular. The Carter family, as they called themselves, used the Bristol sessions to start a long, storied career in country music that lasted until 1944 when A.P. and Sarah divorced, and Sarah married A.P.'s cousin. Still, the Carter family are almost synonymous with country music, especially since Johnny Cash married into it and kind of blended those lines. They are known as the first family of country music, and you'd be hard-pressed to find any country music artist from any era or genre who 
doesn't know and love and respect and get influenced by the Carter family. And all of that started in a little warehouse in Bristol. The Carter family is a really interesting story that deserves its own video that I'll probably do at some point, so subscribe so you don't miss that. The other most important artist that recorded during the Bristol sessions actually came as part of a group. The Teneva Ramblers formed in 1924 and were based out of nearby Asheville, North Carolina. On August 3rd, they traveled to Bristol to record, but then they had an argument with one of their members. When Jimmy Rogers joined the group in 1927, they started going by the Jimmy Rogers Entertainers, but the rest of them wanted to audition and record as the Teneva Ramblers. Jimmy didn't like that, so he went solo and auditioned by himself. The Ramblers would record for Ralph on August 4th, and they did well enough to have a few more recording sessions in 1928, but they never quite broke out in the musical world. However, Jimmy Rogers' auditions and his music changed country music forever. Jimmy was originally from Meridian, Mississippi, but his father worked on the railroad and that caused the family to move around quite a bit. Jimmy always loved the traveling shows that toured through the South, so at the age of 13, after winning a talent show, he kind of ran away from home and joined a medicine show. Eventually, his father had enough of that nonsense, so he tracked Jimmy down, pulled him out of the show and brought him home, and then put him to work on the railroads. So, for a while, Jimmy worked the railroads and he traveled around the South doing a variety of different jobs. But then, in 1924, he got tuberculosis and decided that probably meant he should quit the railroad and he focused more of his attention on music. He would play at a variety of different places, just trying to get anything off the ground, but nothing was really working. And then in the summer of 1927, he heard about Ralph Beer setting up shop in Bristol and thought that could be his opportunity to do something cool. The two songs that Jimmy recorded that day were released by Victor and they were moderate successes. They weren't runaway hits by any means, but they did well enough for Victor to call him back in for a second recording session in October of 1927. During that second session, he recorded the song Blue Yodel. It's now called Blue Yodel Number no. 1 because it did so well that he did a bunch more of them. That song changed his life. It sold over a million copies during his lifetime and made him the breakaway star of this new genre. Unfortunately, Jimmy suffered from health struggles most of his life and ended up passing away while he was still pretty young. But his songs and his recordings and his music was so important to the birth and foundation of country music that he is now known as the father of country music and he was the first inductee into the Country Music Hall of Fame. It's entirely possible that if Ralph Peer never set up his little mobile recording unit in Bristol, the world would never have known about the Carter family or Jimmy Rogers. And where would country music be without them? It's entirely possible that it could have just been a passing fad that faded away. Thanks largely to the Bristol sessions and the art artists that were discovered there, country music became a powerful and long-lasting genre that is still very much flourishing today. So while I was in Bristol, I swung by the birthplace of Country Music Museum to kind of learn more about this story. I knew what the Bristol sessions were, knew a little bit about it, I knew the Carter family and Jimmy Rogers recorded there, but that was kind of it, so I wanted to dig a little bit deeper. Went to the museum and I really enjoyed it. I'm sure my biggest complaint is something that the museum curators also hate. There just really aren't any artifacts from the Bristol sessions to see there. The museum is not set up in the building that the sessions actually occurred in. I think that building was torn down a long time ago. I couldn't really figure out what happened to it, but the actual location is just like a parking lot now. There's like a plaque there to commemorate it, but really nothing to see. So the museum isn't in that spot. The museum isn't even actually on State Street. It's like a block away from State Street. So there's two things that I love about museums and it kind of depends on the museum. One thing is just being where things happened. For example, one of my favorite museums is Franz's Tavern in New York City. It's the old bar where George Washington had like a farewell meal with his officers. The building is still there. The bar is still there. You can go up into the museum and be in the room where George Washington stood and gave a toast and said farewell to his Revolutionary War officers and just like getting to be there is so cool for me at least being able to be in that room where such an important thing happened is so cool and obviously with this birthplace of country music museum you can't do that because the room doesn't exist anymore but then there's the other types of museums that aren't where important things happened but you still get to see really cool artifacts you get to see this cool thing that someone used to do something really special you get to see the cbgb awning if you go to the rock music hall of fame that kind of stuff and the birthplace of country music museum didn't really have any of that. I would have loved to have seen the guitar that Jimmy Rogers used during the session. I would have loved to have seen 
the microphone that Ralph Peer brought with him. I would have loved to seen some of the original records that Ralph made while he was there, but I didn't see any of that. Maybe it was there, maybe I missed it, but I don't really think I did. I just think it either doesn't exist anymore. I think that stuff probably was destroyed or sold or lost long ago, or if it does exist, it might be in the Country Music Museum in Nashville. So I think the museum would probably agree with me and wish they had more of that stuff to show off. They did have like a few guitars that were owned and played by Jimmy Rogers that was really cool to see, as well as like a Bill Monroe mandolin that was awesome to see. But like I said, I don't think there was anything from the actual Bristol sessions there, which was kind of a bummer. That being said, the museum did a fantastic job of telling the story. For this video, I chose to focus on the actual story of the sessions and how important they were, which the museum does a really good job of and does probably a more in-depth job than I did with this video, but they also talk about things that I didn't really cover as much. The museum did an incredible job of setting the Bristol sessions within its historical context. It talked about the developing technology of the day, the idea that recorded music was now accessible to people and you could choose what you wanted to listen to in your own home. They put that within the framework of what was going on in the world, which was really cool to see. They talked more about the technology that Ralph brought with him and how that was new and interesting and exciting. They kind of showed different record players that were popular during the time and kind of talked about why they were popular and what was happening around there. So that like focus on the technological side of it and the industry side of it with like the different label wars that were happening was really cool to see and learn more about. They also did a really good job of kind of breaking down Ralph's importance to the business side. I talked a little bit about the contracts he had artists sign, but they went way more in depth than that and talked more about how revolutionary it was. The museum was really fascinating. It was really well laid out and it was interesting and engaging. And I think if you're ever in Bristol, it's really is a place that's worth going to visit. So that's a little bit of the story of the Bristol Sessions. Let me know what you thought about it using the comments below. Like the video if you liked it and subscribe so you don't miss more stories like this from music history.